I am an advocate. I am so glad to be here with you. I know you are advocates too. And I'm going to talk with you the next little while about some things you may or may not know about how to maximize the impact of advocacy going forward. So let's just roll in. Uh, the chairman of the board of Research America, my organization, is a former member of Congress, uh, John Porter. He is a change agent. He is the person in the Congress who led the charge in the House when he was there um, for 21 years to elevate the National Institutes of Health, to take on finding the cures for a whole range of diseases, to find the solution, find the solutions to what ails us in every sense of the word. So he has, since he's left the Congress, um, been closely associated with us, although we worked with him when he was in the Congress. And he likes to say, to groups like this, if he were here tonight, that you can change the image of things to come. You may not be a researcher, I'm not, but I've spent my career dedicated to advancing research. And there are things you can do, even if you're not a researcher. There's things, in fact, that researchers can't do without you. So it's a wonderful combination. And I understand that there are some researchers and some healthcare professionals here at this conference and hopefully in this room. And I have some particular things to say to you all in a little bit. But it's true that advocacy works. From year to year, it may not make a lot of advances in the political context. And the political context is important to health. Make no mistake about that. But last year, after a lot of years of very little progress, collectively, the community of stakeholders in research did make an impact. We got more funding for the National Institutes of Health. We got a permanent R&D tax uh, credit, and you can read the rest. But there's lots more to come, and it has to happen. But it's about being committed to turning momentum of the last year into a movement, a movement that everybody can be a part of. The context right now for advocacy is very much the context that you may be seeing on the internet, on television, it's just all around us, you know, this extraordinary election year included. But it's also about long-standing issues that this country hasn't had a handle on for a long time, including health care cost and access. But research really is a big part of the solution to that when you think about it. Historically, it always has been. And for people who think that research is expensive, try disease a lot more expensive and takes a toll in ways that go way beyond the money involved. But historically, if you look back over time, it's really patient advocates who have changed the science and research structure as well as the political structure by demanding more. It goes back to the March of Dimes, probably before that, but the March of Dimes was responsible for putting the push on, on Congress, on the American public broadly, by collecting dimes, literally, to assure that we could defeat polio. And indeed, that happened. But more recently, the patient advocacy community, people with HIV AIDS, and those who cared about them and loved them, and a lot of those patients died early on, if you recall, I certainly can. Um, it was the patient community that pushed the science community, that pushed the Congress to do more research, to speed it up, to say, we don't, we don't take, we will not take no for an answer. We want to escalate the pace of science. And we will be involved. We will volunteer to be part of clinical research, clinical trials, so-called. 
will be involved, will push, will continue to push. We won't take no for an answer. Now, we haven't solved the problem altogether of HIV AIDS, of course, but we will. There will be a vaccine. But it, compared to what parents like me were afraid of, terrified about, uh, about in the late 80s, the early 90s, and I was living in San Francisco then with teenage kids, I was terrified. I'm not terrified anymore about HIV AIDS. There are other things to worry about, to be sure. If you have a pregnant daughter like I do, what are you worried about? Zika. And nothing's happening in the Congress about Zika. But there's every family has plenty to be worried about. The point is, push, push, push. We saw it also with the breast cancer community. Tremendous advances. Turning around um, lack of awareness and support into not just advocacy for breast cancer research, but for all of women's health and women's health research. Stunning, stunning. Um, movement, and if you will, success story. There's a lot more to come. And I am familiar with many more uh, in astonishing victories by the patient community. I think it all rests on a conviction that patients have, to, and, and their caregivers and people who love them, have to be part of the research continuum every step of the way, and are a big part of the policy behind research, of enabling of it, of assuring that more money goes into research. I like this motto from the South African disability movement, nothing about us without us. If you're gonna do research about scleroderma, engage the patient community. Find out what is really the um, the thinking of the patients, the willingness, the problems, the insights, importantly, the insights, including scientific insights, even if they're not scientists. They've learned a lot. You have learned a lot about this disease. You can help the science community, and I know you're doing that. You can also help the policy community. So let's, let's do, do a little test here. We call this the Starbucks test. So, you're in, just imagine that you're in, back home, your local Starbucks or wherever you go, it may not be named Starbucks, of course, for a cup of coffee or tea or whatever. So you've got, you got that place pictured, right? Okay, so your member of Congress is there too, on exactly the same errand. Just stopping by on the weekend for a cup of coffee, whatever. So raise your hand if you recognize that member of Congress by sight. Just put your hand up. Oh, this is good. I'd say there's 10, 15 percent out there. Great. Now, second question. Does that person, does that member of Congress recognize you by sight? Put your hand up. I got, I got some. You know, we do this, this is so wonderful. We do this test in lots of groups all over the country. It is quite rare, actually, that people hold up their hand on the second one. Quite rare. This is a challenge, and you're doing it. You're working on it. Because members of Congress respond to what the people in their constituency are all about, what they care about. They know who the educators are. They know who the bankers are. They know who the small business leaders are. They rarely, rarely, rarely know the science community. They may know some physicians, their own. Um, they rarely know the science community and what the science community is doing in the public's interest with tax dollars. They rarely know the patient advocacy community. So why are we surprised when they don't talk about the issue when they're running for re-election, or where, where new candidates are running. This is what we have to turn around. It's one of the things that we're working on. There are some champions in the Congress. I'll show you pictures of a couple of them. There's more, fortunately. 
but there is nothing like the numbers we need to really change the day, speed the day, when we're going to see more support for research and thus more progress in research. So you can, I'm not going to read this out to you, but you can see here the wonderful Chairman Cole, who now has the position that the chair of our board, John Porter, who I started out with, had back in the day. And these two worked together, actually, back in the day when Chairman now Cole was a young congressperson. So he was inspired by Research America's chair, but he was inspired by his constituents as well. Senator Patty Murray, another wonderful, uh, some people from the state of Washington. Another fabulous champion for research, for science. Now, there are lots of others. You'll notice that the first one was a Republican, this one's a Democrat, Senator Murray. And at the National Institutes of Health, which is a huge campus in Bethesda, Maryland, huge, you know who uses that word. Um, anyway, uh, and they're a very large campus. There are a number of buildings named for congressional champions who've stood up for policies and for funding for research. They come from both parties. This is a really important point. Medical research is a bipartisan issue. It's not a nonpartisan issue. It's a bipartisan issue. It makes, the Congress makes the decision for money and for policies that make research happen that drive it. Industry also provides research support. Patient groups like the Scleroderma Foundation provide research support. But the big gorilla, the giant source of funding, is the National Institutes of Health. Also National Science Foundation, CDC, et cetera. But people in the Congress who are champions for research get their names put on the buildings at NIH. And that's the kind of goal we're after. We'd love to see a coal building, a Murray building, and others. So another question, how important is it for you to know whether your candidates for Congress, there's an election coming up as you know, believe that the government should invest more in medical research? Put your hand up if it's important for you to know. Okay, hi, fortunately almost everyone. You can find out, we can help you find out simple a map on our website, and we're filling it out as the election gets closer. But I use this question because it's one of the questions we use in the public opinion polls that we commission from time to time. You can see here that 38% of the public says it's very important, they agree with you, or at least somewhat important, another 39%, it kind of makes you wonder, what about the rest of the people? Do they not have in their families health challenges that they don't have the answer for? Very unlikely every family is thinking about and worrying about something in their family. Maybe there are people who just have opted out of the whole idea of having a government, who knows. But in any case, with this kind of overwhelming public interest in a topic, why aren't we hearing people talk about it who are running for office? It's because the people in their constituency, their voters, aren't talking about it. So one of the things we do every election year is a voter education initiative. This year we're calling it the Campaign for Cures. This is a really simple way to find out what candidates are saying, to communicate with them if you can't do it in person, although that's always better, and to push them to speak up, to be a champion, to talk about what they would do to assure medical progress by putting research to work. So, like us on Facebook, if you've got your little handy device with you right now, you could do it right now. Like us on Facebook. Tweet out to all your network and friends. Get people involved. This is a free and easy way to engage in this election cycle on an issue that you've told me you care about. Some of the aspects of it here, I told you about the map. 
It's filling in. There's a blog, usual bells and whistles. And you may have ideas for us, which we'd love to hear. And stories, we're looking for stories constantly. Now, a few words about the presidential candidates. As you know, if you watched the convention last week or the one this week, neither of them talked about research in their acceptance speeches. We were kind of disappointed. Um, Tim Kaine, the vice presidential nominee, Democratic vice presidential nominee, did, which is a very good sign. And he has a strong and long history in, especially in public health and prevention. He talked about Alzheimer's research. Um, Secretary Clinton has a long history in promoting women's health research and HIV AIDS in particular, and also in being a supporter of the NIH. Mr. Trump has not had much to say on the topic. But these people will talk about it if enough voters ask them to. The good news is both party platforms have positive things to say about medical research. That's good. We worked very, very hard to make this happen. But it's not really a lot. It's not very um, exhaustive. And it's not really a headline in the platforms. So we've got a ways to go. So I've been talking a lot about us. Who are we? Just a couple of words here. Um, we are very clear what our mission is. We think making research to improve health should be a much higher priority in this country right up there with education, defense, transportation, infrastructure, should just roll off the tongues of all of us and of those who represent us. We've been around for 27 years. That same year cause that your wife was diagnosed was when we were founded. And it was found, we were founded by people with personal stories and a lot of conviction to work for a better day. We have a fantastic board as you do. It's larger than your board. It's very active, and we need that. Several former members of Congress in both parties, several people who have led federal agencies, the NIH, the FDA, and leaders um, from the patient community, academia, and industry. Some of the things we're doing currently on Capitol Hill are captured on this slide. We don't need to go through chapter and verse. But what we're doing are, is things every day that help the Scleroderma Foundation and all of our partners and members. We're here to help you. We want to help you. We want your ideas, and we want you to work with us. I talked about public opinion surveys. One of the reasons we do public opinion surveys is that public sentiment matters. It's the uh, be all and end all of people who seek to serve the public's interests. They got to know what the public's interest is. They respond to public sentiment. And it was actually President Lincoln who captured this, I think, beautifully, right around the same time that he founded the National, he commissioned the start of the National Academy of Sciences, he cared deeply about science and research. So we are, we've been commissioning surveys for a long time now. 24 years, some little highlights for you to see. Um, very strong public support for health promotion and prevention research. Let's not get ill to begin with. Let's prevent disease and disability. Very, very strong. We are not spending anything like what we should be to accomplish this goal. We know that a ma strong majority of people would share personal health data if they could and knew how to do it and had some conviction that that would help advance medical research. But that is not what is happening right now. Because we haven't done a good job of connecting the dots in the community about how to engage patients more effectively. In fact, most people say they haven't participated in clinical trials. Let's see a show of hand here. How many of you here have participated in trials? You know, 30, well, maybe 25% or so. But that's not enough. You know, healthy people need to be participating in trials all the time. 
certainly everyone who's been diagnosed can and should help the research community advance by taking part yourself. We know that one of the main reasons that isn't happening is that healthcare providers don't talk about research. We're working on that. We have some ideas about how to change that. You might also, and I'd like to hear those ideas. A um, couple other highlights. People believe that the government should prioritize science, technology, engineering, and math education so that young people have a chance to make a difference in these fields that are quite fulfilling, that help our world, that make a difference. We know that the majority of the public believes that discovery or basic research is important. It's not just a black box of mystery. You've got to have that first before you can have clinical and applied science. Um, and people just generally support science overall, even if they don't know a whole lot about it. It's actually not necessary. You don't need to know how every component of what's under the hood in your car works in order to drive the car and feel good about it. You do need to go where to, uh, who the experts are if something goes wrong. And I think understanding science is similar. If you want to know more about science, there's a lot of good ways to find out, and attending this conference is one of those ways but it isn't essential for feeling positive about it. We also know that people believe that the fair and right thing to do is to do a better job eliminating health disparities among the various groups in our country that are not seeing the benefits of health research. We also know that people trust the science community. I said I had some messages for you, the scientists, this is one of them. They trust healthcare professionals and patient organizations like this one, much more than they trust elected officials. Well, I guess I didn't even have to point that out, right? <laughs> but um, you are the people who should be talking to the rest of the public and to the elected officials who want to be seen with you, want to be supported by you, want you to know their names want you to vote for them. So speaking of scientists, um, we know that Americans express confidence in the science community, although their confidence in all um, professional groups has slipped over the last several decades, but their confidence in the institutional leaders of science um, is high. A lot of information on this slide, but um, along with other groups that are widely respected and in contrast to the Congress, science is up there. And despite that, despite this, ask yourself, can Americans name a living scientist? Now, I know you can, and there's some scientists sitting in this room, but setting aside you for a moment, imagine what the response to this question is when we ask a um, representative sample of the American public. What percentage of, the, of Americans can name a living scientist? Okay, you've got your estimate there. Only 17%. That is not very many. That demonstrates to us that we're not doing a good job in the science community. If, if you are a scientist, if you're an institution represented to, with lots of scientists within your um, walls, you're not doing a good job of connecting to the non-science American public. You can see the names of scientists who are mentioned. A lot of people in the other category are dead, but at least they're scientists, you know, so. I try to hold on to that. But this percentage, the 17, 15 to 17 percent, has not gone up over 25 years. So we are not making much of a dent here. Next one. Do Americans know where research is conducted? Now, you do. But how about, you know, people generally? People who don't make the effort to come to a meeting like this to get engaged in this foundation. Well. Most Americans do not know 
where medical or health research is conducted. Only about a third can name any place where research is conducted. This is incredible to me. They don't say, my state's university. They don't say, the medical center in my town. They do not say that. They respond to a lot of branding by national, uh, nationally known, i.e. well-branded institutions. But the point is really that only 34% can name a place. This is another thing we need to change. And I think that is done by just self-identifying. I'm a scientist. Here's where I work. Connect some dots for people. But non-scientists can help too. It's also true that only 28% of the public um, are aware that medical research in the United States is conducted in every state. There are smart people doing smart science in every state in this country. Very few people seem to know that. And guess what? It's even true of members of Congress. It's shocking how many members of Congress, whom we, by we, people who work with me at Research America, who meet with, and sometimes with their staff, often with their staff, have no idea there's science going on there in their state, in Louisiana, in Oklahoma, in Idaho, in every single state, which is as it should be. Part of the reason, back to that same theme, is the voters in those states are never talking about science, are never asking members of Congress what they're doing to support research and why it's important. Now, the public also says that it's important for scientists to engage with the public on research. People actually want to know what those scientists are doing out there. They may or may not know that their tax dollars are paying for much of that work, or their contributed philanthropic dollars, or the dollars they spend commercially on products to help achieve better health. A lot of that money goes to research, but people haven't connected the dots. Pretty simple. Now I say to the science community, a warning. If you're not an advocate as a scientist, it could be hazardous to your research career, especially if you're federally funded. But actually, all the policies that the, the Congress considers and makes into laws and, and, and policies um, affect research no matter where it's conducted or who is funding it. It's pretty important, but very few members of the science community take the time to get to know their elected officials or to make the case for research. It doesn't have to be self-serving. It's about serving the public's interest. Scientists, elected officials, and actually journalists too, have in common, even when they think they have nothing in common, and they often do think that, they do have in common serving the public's interest. And it's a worthy choice of careers, however you enact it. Um, so what can you do? Whether you're a scientist or a patient, what can you do as an advocate? Here's some things. You can talk about the positives. You can talk about aspirations we all share for better health. And you can talk about how research pays off. There's plenty of historical examples and things that are happening right now. You can use in-the-moment news to illustrate public aspirations. Right now, I mentioned Zika earlier. Zika is terrifying to a lot of people. Why aren't we doing more about it? Pumping money into research, pumping money into prevention, handling it now before, actually, many people would say we should have been doing this six, nine months ago when we first became aware, collectively, the world community became aware that this was and is and will be a worse public health crisis. So even talking about that when the, it's on the news and then bridging to, I was just at a scleroderma patient education conference. I learned some things about research. Let me tell you what I learned and what needs to happen next. People who care about you Care about how you spend your time and what you care about, what you're committed to. And you can bridge from where you were in the last few days or what's in the news to what needs to happen. Um, 
The rest of these, emphasizing how research drives the economy, is an argument that comes very natural to people who are in business, especially if they are in the business of commercializing the adva advances in science and technology. But just in general, these are good jobs working in, in and around research. Um, I mentioned already the 21st Century Cures Initiative, and I do really encourage you to take a look at that to pledge that you'll do something, to add your name to an ever-growing list. And next month, in August, there's things you can do each week in the month of August to help us and a lot of other people who are working with us drive a particular piece of legislation that involves both policy and money across the finish line in September before this Congress wraps up its work for the year. There's ways to get involved in that. It's really very simple, won't take a lot of your time, but boy, can it make a difference. What is that legislation? I'm not gonna tell you everything there is to know about it, but there are some important points about it. It's stalled in the Senate right now. People like Patty Murray are champions who can make this happen. You folks from Washington State, get in touch with her. Do it tonight. Twitter, but do it for sure. And there are other people, actually, ultimately, every member of the Senate is gonna be voting on this, and every member will do something to get it across the finish line if their constituents ask them to. And the more, the better. A broad significance of this legislation is that it's been a big part of the momentum we've seen in both houses of Congress. Whoops, how did I do that? There we go. Um, the <laughs> broad significance of the legislation helps connect the dots, etc. I'm going to finish with a few thoughts, and only a few, about authentic communication. You heard it from cause earlier. It comes from the heart, and it makes a difference. When we're talking to policymakers, those aspects matter a lot. Sometimes when scientists talk to policymakers, as Alan Alda has said famously, he's, they're not communicating, they're actually excommunicating people from science. If you ever hear, if you're not a scientist, and you hear a scientist, whether it's at this conference or otherwise, talking in ways that you don't understand and can't connect to, help everybody out by asking them to reel it back a little bit straighten things out for me so I can follow what you're saying and get on board with you and be your advocate and champion. That's what a real partnership is about. Authentic communication is at the heart of it. What you're driving for, especially in talking to policymakers, but for all of us, is a so-called pick up the pen moment. When you hear something, you think, wow, I want to remember that. Or I want to make sure that I know how to get back to that information on a website or to a person who really inspired me or told me something I didn't know before. You're looking for that moment. I already mentioned this to me, very famous quote from a woman who I met late in her life but was very encouraging and motivating to me, Mary Lasker. If you think research is expensive, try disease. That's what to say to people who say, well, there's just not enough money. I'm sorry, there's not enough money in this government budget to fund more research for scleroderma. That's nonsense. Of course there is. The taxpayers want there to be. Just big numbers. There are a lot of big numbers associated with government expenditures in this big country. So how about some comparisons? We spend $3 billion on summer camp for children, or we did last year, probably more this year. Now that would be enough to fund the one of the institutes at the NIH, the one that covers scleroderma fund research, for six years. And it's way more than scleroderma research, by the way, in NIAMS. There's lots of little connections like that that you can use to push back on that argument that we can't afford. But to get back to the story from the heart, 
the way to really engage people is not with all the facts or the comparisons to other things that we spend money on, although they're good, they're important, but with feelings, to connect to people on a level that it's about telling your story from the heart and talking about what matters to you and what you aspire to and how you share aspirations with everybody else. Tell your story. One of the first people that we ever gave an advocacy award to at Research America when we started our program of awards to advocates 20 years ago was Sharon Monsky. Maybe some of you knew her. I had never heard of scleroderma until I met Sharon. But boy, did she have an impact on me and on everybody in the room that night and beyond. And there were a lot of members of Congress in the room. Telling your story is an astonishingly important and high impact thing to do, as is building relationships. It's what it's all about. Patients and researchers going together to meet with members of Congress is incredibly high impact, high impact. Getting involved in an election, even if you don't like a lot that you've heard about this election, is really important. People running for Congress will listen to you, especially now, especially in the next 100 plus days. Please send a message. Put a face on the importance of research and of finding the cures. Make it your face. We want to help. We work for you. I am very proud to work for you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight.